My name is Amitosh Gautam. I am senior manager in the climate program at WRI India. On behalf of World Resources Institute India, I would like to thank each one of you uh, to join us in this flagship event called Connect Karo 2023. This event has chronicled huge success each year and this is the ninth edition of this program. On behalf of WRI, I would like to welcome our distinguished guest, panelists and all the delegates present here in today's program. So just to start, when we talk about the enterprise-led development, MSMEs are considered as the building blocks. Often cited as the backbone of our economy, I would rather say that they are the foundation at which enterprises perform. In Professor C.K. Prahalad's parlance, I would say that they are considered as the bottom of the pyramid and hence needs to be supported through a multidimensional approach given the challenges posed by the climate change. I would also like to quote from the book called The Man's Search for Meaning that there is still jobs need to be done. And in this context, uh, it is the MSMEs where the job needs to be done. So let us now invite uh, and start our today's proceedings by welcoming Mr. Jarnel Singh, a Deputy Director, India Office at the MacArthur Foundation. Mr. Singh co-manages the India portfolio of the Foundation's grant making. During his time at Terry and the Climate Group, Mr. Singh worked in the fields of energy transition, access to clean energy and business-led climate action. Along with many accolades, Mr. Singh was also named as the Feldman Fellow at Brandeis University in 2011. We welcome you, Mr. Singh. I am excited to welcome our next honorable guest, Ms. Grace Pachau. Ms. Grace is an IS officer of 2014 batch. She served in various capacities in the government of Tamil Nadu and is currently posted as Additional Commissioner Industries and Commerce Department and Executive Director of Fame TN in Chennai. May I request Ms. Grace to kindly take the seat, please. Next, I would like to welcome Dr. Arun Panda, Senior Fellow at WRI. Dr. Panda is former Secretary, Ministry of MSME, Government of India. His initiatives include government supports for 120 technology centers to enhance manufacturing competitiveness of MSMEs. He was also instrumental in refurbishing the credit guarantee scheme and fast-tracking the MSME funds of funds. At WRI India, he advises the climate and energy program on just and low carbon transition in MSMEs clusters in India. With this brief introduction, may I now request Mr. Jarnail Singh to kindly provide his opening remarks to the audience. Thank you, Amitosh. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Still morning, right? Okay. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. And thank you so much, Ashwini and team. Uh, from WRI for making us a part of this uh, wonderful initiative. I mean, we can all see, I mean, those people who have come from outside um, will realize that Delhi is, is a capital right now for the face of uh, climate crisis, as it's being touted. Uh, whether we could say it as uh, unjust or uh, unjust development also, it's, it's the jury is out. I'll not comment on that, but one thing is clear that effects of the climate crisis will be borne more by the people who have contributed least to it. And that's why this convening today becomes incredibly important. Um, and when we say just transition, we could look at it in two forms. One is to mitigate the effects of uh, the current energy transition on communities who will be left out of it. And the second could be to build a better society at the back of this transition. So I'll not get into too much of detail or technical jargon here, but one thing is clear that we have to use this opportunity to build a better society right now. And that's what we as part of MacArthur Foundation are looking at very closely and not just at the national level, but at the sub-national level. And that's where states like Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Odisha, uh, West Bengal, Uttar Pradesh, they become very, very important from this perspective. So, um, Coming to another point, I think uh, at the foundation, how we define a climate solution is a solution which does not just work for the rich, but also works for the poor. And when I say poor, it's not just the income disparity that we're facing, 
but the communities who will get left out of this whole transition and communities who are facing the climate crisis firsthand i was in odisha last week um and i could i had the privilege to visit one of the fisher folk village where the cultural uh, the where the beach has eroded because of the climate change and the sea level rise as a result of which it's a ghost village and when while interacting with fisher folk over there i figured out that there are a series of ghost villages on that shore from puri to gopalpur this was the first time me going over there from a climate change mitigation point of view understanding resilience first hand so that's where this title vulnerability to resilience has become a lived experience now not really lived experience but at least i i went there as a tourist but i figured out how lived experience uh, lived experiences shape up with this background in climate crisis climate change mitigation and equity uh, we embarked on this ambitious initi initiative in 2021 uh with wri wherein we looked at communities who will be impacted more including micro small medium enterprises who form the supply chain as amitosh also mentioned who form the backbone of the currents uh, of the country's uh, economy as as a key as a key uh, player in this whole transition and that's where i'm i'm really pleased that uh, we are we are reporting uh, we are launching a few reports today and um, since i have just come back from odisha i also would like to mention that these are not uh, isolated transitions these are not isolated communities they are a part of a system and we are all systems thinkers uh, innately at the household level probably but not at the city level not at the country level not at the state level that's why we need to look at a systems lens and i would just like to pull in another anecdote from odisha wherein when we spoke to the fisher folk over there and asked about migration for instance they mentioned that they migrate to surat for the diamond polishing industry they migrate to ludhiana for the textile industry they migrate to kerala for some other industry so all these people human capital from source districts the climate vulnerability hotspots are migrating to other districts and working there in not great conditions and they are again the ones who are going to get left out of this transition as we switch to clean energy while larger conglomerates private sector will have access to technical advice consultants as well as financing mechanisms people in the supply chain in the scope 3 emissions as we call them might not have access to those and i really really have a lot of admiration for wri's work for including them as part of this initiative and wish you all the best and i look forward to the great deliberations today thank you thank you thank you mr singh uh, for your opening remarks uh, very well said that uh, this is the need of the hour for bringing the just transition perspective uh, in the msme development phase uh, may i now request ms grace prachau to give the special address very good morning to all uh, wonderful to be here dr arun panda former uh, ministry of um, msme secretary and now senior fellow wri um mr jarnal singh deputy director uh, macarthur office uh, uh, india office uh, foundation uh, mr amitosh gautam and ms ashwini and all my dear friends who are here so i've um, come all the way from um, chennai uh, to be part of this and i would like to extend my gratitude to wri for uh, inviting me here as part of this connect karo uh, 2020 conference Uh, so our collaboration with wri began last year which culminated in the signing of an mou between wri and the government of tamil nadu represented by fame tn fame tn is an organization under the msme department uh, which is headed by the industries uh, commissioner and i'm also the executive director of fame tn so uh, wri has been working with the government of tamil nadu closely and uh, in fact this uh, report that they are uh, seeking to um, release today on that uh, just transition uh, from ice uh, vehicle manufacturing to electronic vehicle that was a study that they had undertaken in coimbatore they have uh, uh, done a very very comprehensive report i don't know how many of you have gone through that report i went through it over the weekend and i was extremely impressed uh by the way in which they have covered every aspect of um, uh, everything that is important uh from um the need for finance to technology transfer reskilling upskilling um awareness creation so um as uh, dr singh just rightly mentioned uh for the bigger enterprises for the large industries 
uh, transitioning is uh, extremely easy. But when you look at the micro, small and medium enterprises, it becomes uh, quite difficult because of the resources uh, crunch they face, because of the high cost of uh, technology adoption, uh, you know, the cost involved in uh, skilling, access to finance. So all of these things become uh, quite problematic. And I'm extremely grateful to that organizations like WRI are here in order to undertake uh, studies and also uh, facilitate MSMEs. Uh, in the you know various needs and requirements as well and coming to um, the state of Tamil Nadu um, I would like to talk briefly about Tamil Nadu because I, I guess that I mean uh, hardly anybody if, uh, here is from Tamil Nadu maybe with the exception of Supratish who's also who's Tamilian so yeah so Tamil Nadu is a very very industrialized state um, we have also the third highest number of MSMEs in the country uh, after Uttar Pradesh and West Bengal. Our MSME sector is extremely strong uh, uh, traditionally in the fields of um, uh, automobile component manufacturing. Uh, textiles is something that uh, we have also excelled in for uh, many, many years. Um, apart from that, heavy engineering and even um, electronics and its components. Uh, in fact, in um, June, uh, just last month, um, our electronics exports uh, was the highest in the country. We have, uh, I think it's about 4 billion US dollars of electronics exports have gone out of the country. So we have been uh, very strong in these um, uh, sectors, uh, but of late, uh, we are also seeing a rise in uh, the newer sectors like, say, EV, um, fintech, uh, SaaS, uh, these are more, you know, going into the startup territory, but uh, nonetheless. So these are some of the, you know, new uh, sectors that are emerging in Tamil Nadu. And um, we think that there will be a lot of positive developments in uh, future as well. And uh, with regard to uh, electric vehicles, I would um, specifically talk about this because WRI uh, since they have done a study and releasing their uh, publication on this as well so uh, the EV um, sector is also something that you know uh, the government is also cognizant of and we are uh, taking a lot of steps into uh, facilitating uh, the growth of EV manufacturing in Tamil Nadu in fact uh, last month the industry's minister had called for a meeting with all the CEOs and the top uh, executives of various um, auto manufacturing companies and EV companies as well. Uh, this was attended by various other uh, line departments, including our own MSME department, the transport department, home department, skill uh, development corporation. And uh, our MSME department, we are also establishing an EV CFC, Common Facility uh, Center in Coimbatore. Uh, the DEPR preparation is underway. And we hope to establish this in a couple of years from uh, now on. And uh, so in the morning, I was just, uh, you know, on this uh, conversation I had with uh, uh, some of the participants here. We were talking about why the EV demand in Tamil Nadu is still quite low compared to states like UP and cities like even Delhi and Bangalore. So I said, you know, it's because uh, probably because Tamilians are very, I mean, they, they're very like, as Suprajit said, they are more like they're a little bit wary and they want to see the trident tested uh, things first so i think uh, even uh, working towards um, you know creating that consumer awareness and building confidence uh, 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 amongst the people is something that is also needed because only when there is uh, you know good demand for like ev and the importance of shifting to renewable sources of energy people will be able to understand why it's important to transition from you know uh, fossil fuels to renewable sources of energy as well so um, yeah, we have also come up with like uh, the EV policies of uh, 2019 and recently uh, we had another uh, EV, a new EV policy in uh, that was launched in February 2023 as well. And um, again, uh, with regards to other sectors as well, like in our MSME department, since we have so many MSMEs about like there are about five to six million MSMEs in Tamil Nadu who are engaged in uh, numerous uh, sectors which I had spoken of the traditional heavy engineering, electronics, textiles, then a uh, lot of um, MSMEs engaged in uh, say a choir sector. I don't know if you know choir, it's that uh, 
uh, product from the coconut uh, fiber uh, so we have uh, a huge variety of um, you know different msmes engaging in different sectors and we also understand the need for um, you know sectoral uh, intervention because uh, you know the requirement of one msme is not the same as that of another msme which is doing a completely different thing so um, sectoral intervention based on the needs and requirements of that particular sector is something that we are cognizant of and working towards the same and um, apart from this um, uh, again uh, quality certifications energy efficiency is something that uh, we have also taken up on uh, top priority in fact um, Tamil Nadu uh, we have become the highest uh, the state with the uh, highest number of Z certifications I don't know if you are aware of the Z certification it's a zero effect zero defect scheme by the um, MSME ministry I think sir would be aware of it uh, so we have uh, uh, surpassed Punjab into becoming the state with uh, the highest number of uh, Z certifications amongst our MSMEs. We also undertake, um, you know, all these energy efficient, we see workshops throughout the states, through our DICs and also uh, try to facilitate MSMEs to obtain quality certifications as well. And um, so with this, I would like to, um, yeah, again, extend my gratitude to WRI MacArthur Foundation for organizing this um, event. I think it would be extremely uh, helpful for all of us to um, understand um, uh, what is needed to transition from, you know, this um, uh, existing model that we have into a more uh, holistic one, uh, into one with less dependence on fossil fuels and um, uh, more on uh, the importance of decarbonization and reducing our carbon footprints and so on. And I would also like to uh, say that, again, it is not possible for one department or one organization to work in silos. I would like to reiterate it. It is extremely important uh, for uh, you know all the governments to work together, all the various line departments of the state government to work with the government of India, to work with um, people from the industry, experts, academia, and organizations like uh, you know WRI, MacArthur Foundation. So I believe that if all of us can collaborate and work together, I think we can uh, achieve uh, you know great things in future so thank you very much for having me here yeah. thank you very much ma'am for highlighting the key uh, important points and the work the government of Tamil Nadu is doing for MSMEs uh, in our work at WRI uh, we definitely see uh, that the efforts uh, the department is placing how they are being supported and at the same time we see that from the climate vulnerability per perspective the current projects which we are doing uh, uh, MSMEs need to make climate resilient and I will also relate to the point Mr. General Singh talked about the migration issues as we see as we are working in Surat in the textile cluster in, in our recent project. So from the Ganjam district how the migration is happening and uh, the people are moving to these places. So in our work we are trying to see that uh, how we can help these workers in upskilling them, reskilling them. These are the major issues because MSMEs they are supported from the workers and they really need that kind of education information and needs to be supported. So these are a few of the points. I am sure that our panel which we have invited they are going to have more deliberations to it. Um, uh, and uh, we would now like to request uh, Dr. Arun Panda and the panel and the uh, guest at the dais to kindly release. Uh, okay, so I request Dr. Arun Panda to kindly speak few words and then we will release the publication. Thanks. Yeah, just made a few points. So, <clears throat> well, good morning, uh, everyone. I can see um, some known faces. I think Ulka, Ashwini, Priyal, and uh, Amitosh. Uh, I don't know. I'm maybe forgetting some others. But uh, yeah, uh, Mr. S Singh and, and Miss Grace spoke so well. In fact, they spoke quite a bit of... Uh, things that I, I thought I would speak. So I would kind of, you know, uh, uh, but again, uh, right at the outset, I would like to really uh, congratulate WRI and MacArthur uh, Foundation for really taking up this issue, you know, which is, which is an extremely important and very relevant, uh, you know, issue to be taken up now. Uh, this is the time. Now, friends, we are talking about just transition uh, of MSMEs. There are three important words, just transition and MSMEs. I will I will start perhaps, you know, from the MSMEs, then go to transition, then go to just, you know, what do you mean by just? Uh, <clears throat> well, MSMEs, as you know, it has been already talked about, you know, how important are they in the entire value chain? 
But one important thing that we uh, we must keep in mind that MSMEs actually employ a very large number of people. I mean, they are uh, uh, only next to uh, agriculture, the second to agriculture in employment uh, generation. So that's very, very important. And in a country like ours, um, you know, where we have this very young, uh, huge young population. So where, uh, you know, people actually, you know, in the rural area, they tend to really work in the nearby you know whatever uh, enterprise whichever whichever is there so they are very large employment givers i mean that's that's something extremely important uh, now they have very typical characteristics that many people do not know they think msmes are just like you know small and they are smaller than the large ones but you know they will have the same uh, kind of characteristics no uh, they are completely uh, like they have very special characteristics there are some I mean, hugely resilient, uh, uh, but there are they face huge challenges. Uh, the challenges are in too many fronts. Like, for example, uh, getting uh, like you know uh, finance. I mean, of course, things are really improving. Uh, you know, when the GST came, it was it was a big challenge for the MSMEs, as you all would be knowing. <clears throat> that was a big challenge. But then, through GST, they have started coming into the formal economic. Uh, or the transaction framework. I mean, that's something extremely important. Uh, there are issues in, in, in financing, in getting uh, the right technology and keep updating that technology, which is required. Uh, unlike the large ones, as Mr. Singh just very rightly pointed out, they have got uh, these uh, consultants, they have got all, they can source their finance from, you know, uh, from very, very uh, low interest uh, finance. Uh, but, but unlike them, the MSMEs face all, the, all these challenges. And when we're talking about transition or something, it will involve uh, investment, investment in manpower, investment in, in machinery, investment in everything. So they have this and then technology, finance, and then, then uh, information. I mean, uh, there's a huge issue of information uh, asymmetry as far as the MSMEs are concerned. So we have to keep that in mind when we are talking about just transition of MSMEs. What are their, what are their, uh, you know, characteristics? What are their general traits of these of these small enterprises or these medium enterprises or micro enterprises? Now, and they also have special, I like, and I said challenges, but they also have these vulnerabilities, uh, which we have been kind of, you know, seeing in many places. You know. Uh, if there is a flood or something, they, they kind of, you know, it really impacts them disproportionately, you know, very, very highly. Or there is some climate change and other things. So they really, I mean, those are very huge vulnerabilities. Uh, now, when we are talking about um, the MSMEs, now and a lot of things are happening in the, in the world, and especially in our country also. Like the technology is changing very fast. You know, we are talking about Internet of Things. We are talking about machine learning. We are talking about artificial intelligence. All these things are happening when the the larger ones, their competitors, the large uh, you know enterprises are able to really take advantage of all that stuff. But whether the MSMEs are able to take advantage, I mean, that's something that we have to really look at when all these different things are happening. We have a climate you know crisis or change or whatever these challenges and at the same time the technological changes you know all these things are happening simultaneously whether msmes uh, with their vulnerabilities uh, but remember i mean uh, make no mistake that they, i mean they are, they are very very resilient that's how they have been able to really withstand all these different uh, you know different challenges all through the time and then they have been able to really do well so well in many places and they happen to be extremely important in the value chain so when it comes to let's go to the next word transition you know i talked about the technological transition i talked about the the climate transition i mean all these things which are happening that there is a whole lot of paradigm shift which is happening like you know all these changes are inevitable i mean the climate Change, the, the, the problems that we face are absolutely inevitable. So in this transition, how do MSMEs handle them and, 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 and keep their resilience intact, keep their, you know, keep 
keep really improving developing and contributing to the to the nation's uh, economy the nation building and also to the entire value chain i mean that's something and how how they can remain competitive i mean that's something that which is extremely important if they are not competitive nobody is going to buy from them i mean that's as simple as that so when we talk about all this now on this value chain when we are talking about now who, there are many stakeholders now today we are going to talk about uh, like two publications are going to come that that's going to be released but remember there are so many stakeholders not just the government for example uh, ms grace talked about like the tamil nadu government's various initiatives what they are doing and i i believe uh, you know most state governments in this country there are some uh, national programs of government of india but there are also some state level programs special initiatives that many states are taking up it's our duty to kind of to to sort of uh, to do that advocacy with the with the state governments with the respective state governments to actually come up with these new novel things novel initiatives then there are like industry associations there are financing mechanisms should be i think mr singh is here uh, and there are banks nbfcs there are like uh, fintech uh, companies which are coming up and so many things so every one of them would have a role to play uh in this transition to help the msmes now when we're talking about these uh msmes this transition how it can be just so that the disruptions can be less disruptions can be minimized and people can be there can be just transition what do you mean by just you know it is it is just it is equitable and it is inclusive that means as mr singh was pointing out people should not be left behind they should be they should come so what can wri what can macarthur foundation and what can all the stakeholders do in fact even even i can i can tell you i mean you all know this that even the large companies i used to say that all the large companies also have a huge role to play i mean in this because you know they source their their materials from these small msmes so what what kind of role they can play now this session uh, is exploring uh, you know the 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 possibilities or exploring you know the what are the needs of msmes in this in this transition the transition is inevitable what is the, what is what is the what what do they need and how to address them so that is basically the kind of you know this session is trying to explore that now uh wri has been working uh, in two clusters one is in surat uh, which is the which is the textile cluster where where uh, they are going to really you know do the field studies and all that stuff that they going to do and the second is uh, in coimbatore the the the, uh, the ev cluster or the my you know the vehicle the automobile cluster where how can from the existing you know icev uh, you know manufacturing or something how can be how can the msmes and others can uh, transition to the electric vehicle uh, manufacturing that's the kind of thing that cluster has been taken up apart from that chennai also uh, has been also taken up i think that's going to be taken up also at the automobile uh, cluster so all these studies which are happening basically to identify the 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 interventions which are required you know to to make this particular transition you know as smooth as possible and to make them future ready you know so what kind of like for example uh, skill sets that they need what kind of skill sets uh, do they need you know when we are talking about msmes let's not forget that msmes just do not consist of the owners of the enterprise you know it also has like you know those people who are working there the workers so you know each has a, a different challenge or 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 similar challenge you know some different challenges to really face and address so how to em- enable them how to empower them so those both the msme owners and the msme workers that's one second the building their capacity you know by skilling reskilling upskilling you know sometimes they might have to relocate from you know one place to another i mean that's something which we have to kind of be mindful of now there are uh, special focuses of these two uh, publications if i can just quickly uh, sort of you know just flag them uh, the first publication which is going to be released is uh, uh, enabling a just transition for msmes and workers in indian automobile industry automotive industry this is the first publication the second one 
uh, is women workers in Indian MSME challenges for a just transition. Why women? Because they also have other challenges, you know, the structural challenges, you know, women are generally like, you know, not paid at parity and there are many, many other things, you know, which, which the women workers specifically, you know, uh, so there is a gender perspective which uh, WRI is trying to bring in so that at least, you know, these kind of things can be addressed. And in both the things, uh, so in the women also, it outlines um, the structural and the resource barriers, for example, for the for the women workers. So uh, this is going to be an extremely interesting uh, study of both these publications. And I thank WRI and the entire team uh, who have been actually going to the field and talking to the people and doing all this. And also uh, for MacArthur Foundation for, for helping WRI. And now I would request uh, uh, Ashuni, would you like to just so with those words i thank you all and i thank uh, i thank uh, wri specifically and also macarthur foundation and also uh, miss grace who has come all the way to from from chennai where we know uh, the state government of tamil nadu like many other state governments they have been really focusing uh, on 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 msmes and you know how how can they can um, they can uh, sort of progress and they can be uh, play a more important role in the value chain thank you very much thank you Thank you to our DICE dignitaries for releasing the publications. Uh, with this, uh, uh, may I now request Ms. Ashwini Hingne uh, for giving a brief presentation about our work. And uh, to briefly introduce uh, uh, Ashwini, uh, she is Associate Program Director in the Climate Program at WRI. She is a climate policy researcher and economist with over a decade of experience in the field of climate change mitigation. Thank you. So welcome everyone and thank you once again for joining us here and thank you especially to our uh, very, very uh, esteemed uh, uh, speakers here. Um, I will not repeat a lot of things, but I would definitely like to highlight a few important things, especially when we talk about uh, building resilience for MSMEs uh, and enabling a just transition. Um, so as Dr. Panda said, as, Dr. as Mr. Singh also said, as a growing economy, as an economy where we have the largest working age population, MSMEs are at the heart of our economy and development. Uh, they are, even though majority of the MSMEs serve these, uh, are part of the services sector, they, they contribute 37% to our total manufacturing output. As India looks to increase its industry growth, they will form a very key role. On the other hand, they're also one of the key sectors that contribute 42% in value to our total exports. At the same time, MSMEs are also essential as we go to meet our uh, uh, national uh, climate goals. So on the one hand, uh, MSMEs contribute 25% to the total energy consumption. At the same time, even though they have a lot of potential, only 15% of MSMEs are currently electrified. Rest of them are reliant highly on fossil fuels. They have a high potential of even rooftop solar and 15% uh, of the estimated potential is only from the energy efficiency uh, interventions. At the same time, MSMEs are also extremely vulnerable to climate impacts. Currently, India ranks seventh in the Climate Risk Index, which just shows the criticality of building resilience across India. But especially for MSMEs, as we saw in the Chennai floods, they suffered uh, losses in, in the tune of uh, 1,700 crores due to the, uh, the floods. And at the same time, we've seen productivity losses due to the heat uh, stress that we have experienced in the recent years. Now, as we look at the low carbon transition, yes, MSMEs will need to transition, but all MSMEs are not alike. And majority of our MSMEs, almost 99% of our MSMEs are micro and small and 108 million of the 110 million that we saw are working in these really, really small enterprises, largely informal, largely migrant workforce, uh, and almost 44% of them do not have access to formal credit. What they have access to are informal sources of credit, which are extremely high interest. 
if we just look at where this employment is coming from so these are the top 10 sectors by employment and as you can see the key sectors here are textiles and apparel again india and indian msmes are part of global value chains in this sector the other is basic metals motor vehicles again a key uh, exporter as well as a internal uh, market for the ice vehicles and msmes these are this is where our msmes are really operating if we look closer at specifically the ice industry or the internal combustion engine manufacturing industry it has already been growing much faster than estimates have predicted and if india is to meet its net zero goals our studies have shown that 30% of the cars sold by 2030 uh, will need to be electric and 90% by 2050 this transition is not just happening in india but also in markets where indian msmes are exporting components to so uh, eu as well as north america have taken targets to transition to electric vehicles and procuring only electric vehicles again this is an uh, a change that will impact the msmes who are catering to this sector but what does this change really entail this is a very common um, a term that uh, or a quote that we see that the number of parts in a car are going to go from 2000 to 20 but this is not the end of the story it is also the process that is changing it is also the materials that the msmes and the workers are handling and this is 10.5 million workers who are engaged in only manufacturing the components and the servicing both of these parts of the value chain will change entirely if we look at the textile sector again it's similar but very different while we don't see a very very clear technology change like from ice to ev we do see a change due to global trends towards decarbonization there are several companies more than 258 that have taken science based targets which include decarbonization of the supply chain there is also a shift towards circular economy which means more recycling lesser demand for virgin materials as well as automation india itself has set up an esg task force so that uh, environmental and social compliance uh, comes again in this sector all of these changes will affect the msmes who are operating in this sector but once again this sector is very unique firstly because it employs 45 million people in direct and indirect jobs 60% of these are women who structurally are vulnerable uh, in most societies and 70% of workers working in the major hubs uh, major textile hubs are migrants so we'll just took a take a very quick look at some of the research uh, insights that we have uh, which are captured in the conference proceedings uh, but just to highlight um the first thing is that msmes a lot of them are unaware of how the low carbon transition might impact them and also what could be the opportunities of this low carbon transition when you be talk to them and when they see these changes happening like ms grace said they want to see tried and tested things they want to know what is the business case for making investments because msmes are not operating on the time scales of 2070 they're looking at the picture in the next quarter so what is important uh, in what we found is that we need to really develop a business case for climate action but also transitioning to a low carbon economy and also highlight to them what the opportunities are uh and this is best done not through research papers perhaps but also through case studies and testimonials uh that they can relate to the next thing is even if they are convinced that they need to take action do they have the necessary tools do they have the necessary capacity to really undertake the necessary actions what also comes in the way is finance uh that needs to be more accessible uh that needs to be uh low cost and uh, easier to access So again here there are two key uh, recommendations one is of course a uh, support not just from the government but also from the larger companies who are driving these transitions who are expecting msmes to keep up with the pace of the transition and simplified processes and low uh, interest loans finally uh, women and migrants are particularly vulnerable and do not have the same access even with the available skilling and finance options so again interventions need to be targeted they need to consider the structural barriers that this these stakeholders face and uh, also look at this transition as an opportunity 
uh, for the MSMEs, for the women and migrant workers to have better livelihoods and better jobs. The way we've currently been working is beyond the research that you might typically see from coming from the, the economy-wide studies. What the work that really needs to be done on the ground requires mapping what the transition is going to look like for different sectors because this is different. The next is to build awareness on the business case for climate action, on taking up on the opportunities of the low carbon transition. The third is to create skilling programs, not just for the new workforce that is coming into uh, the workforce, but also for existing workers, for uh, employees across different levels within MSMEs, but also to create skilling programs that will be accessed and taken up for MSMEs and workers to leave their day jobs to go for a training itself is a challenge. So how do we make the right model for training for the MSMEs and workers? And finally, creating demonstrable examples, uh, both in terms of challenges as well as in terms of solutions. Some of the capacity building we've been doing has received a lot of interest from MSMEs. These are resources that have been available online, that are available online. Uh, and if you know anyone who might be interested, there's a QR code here to link uh, for a link to these trainings. We've also been doing in-person trainings, uh, starting with Coimbatore, but also coming up in Chennai and Surat, where we've again received a lot of questions, lot of interest, lot of uh, attendance. Uh, like Ms. Grace said, uh, we have uh, partnered with FAMETN uh, and we will be rolling out the skilling program for uh, Coimbatore MSMEs in the month of August and we expect to uh, uh, support at least 150 MSMEs to take the first steps to transitioning to EV. What we aim to achieve, and this is especially with the support of the work that we've already done uh, with MacArthur Foundation, but also ongoing work with the Aries Charitable Foundation under their CREST initiative, we are looking to reskill and upskill more than 100 MSMEs and more than 1,000 workers in building their resilience to climate impacts, in building their capacities to decarbonization, and creating skilling programs in these two clusters so that workers as well as MSMEs are able to transition in a just and equitable manner. But of course, there's a lot more that needs to be done. How can MSMEs realize the tangible benefits that the low carbon transition brings in? How can we design inclusive skilling programs? And how do we facilitate better and more effective finance? So I'll leave with, this, with these few questions that we will explore in the upcoming panel. But just before that, I would like to maybe show again something that has been very innovative and tried by MSME in Coimbatore. The management asked me to uh, take uh, women employees for uh, as a part of this production. So that time actually I opposed. <laughs> so because I don't know whether uh, they can work uh, with us. If we give the exposure and uh, the training to them, so they can easily understand. And also they can they manage everything. It, the production and productivity will not affect with the women. So right now I'm very comfortable with working with women. ஒரு <laughs> ஒரு <laughs> Uh, led by women and employing women. So once again, this is an opportunity for a really inclusive low carbon transition. With that, Amitosh. Thank you, Ashwini, for 
highlighting the, the important work which WRI is doing in the MSME space. And uh, with this, uh, uh, the initial introductory part is concluded and now we will start the panel discussion. Uh, and I would now like to request uh, all of our dais dignitaries to kindly take these seats in the front and uh, let us now begin with the panel discussion. Firstly, I would like to welcome with great pleasure Dr. R. K. Singh, Chief General Manager at SIDB. Uh, Dr. Singh presently heads cli Green Climate, Energy Efficiency and International Cooperation at SIDB. As Head of Promotion and Development, uh, he founded and ran Mission Swab Lumban. And from 2005 to 13, he managed multi-partnership MSME financing and development programs. Next, uh, Dr. Sabina Devan, President and Executive Director of Jobs, Just Jobs Network. Dr. Devan is the Founder and Executive Director of the Jobs, Just Jobs Network. She is also a Senior Visiting Fellow at the Center for Policy Research in India. Our next panelist is Dr. Ila Patnaik, Chief Economist at Aditya Birla Group. Uh, Dr. Pat Patnayak, uh, prior to this, she served at various positions of repute, such as former principal economic advisor to the government of India. Uh, and uh, our next speaker as panelist is Mr. Vini Mehta, Director General, Automotive Component Manufacturer Association of India. He is an alumnus of IIT BHU and he leads ECMA. Uh, I now welcome Dr. Vijay Yadav, Executive Director, Textile Sector Skill Council. Uh, he is also an alumnus, alumnus of IIT Delhi and since 2015 he has overseen operations at the Textile Sector Skill Council under the Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. Uh, I welcome Ms. Shija John, Senior Program Manager uh, and Lead at Kriya University. And, uh, um, and I, on behalf of WRI, I would like to welcome all our panelists, uh, Mr. Prem Bharti, Technical Officer at Skill Council for Green Jobs. And he has more than a decade of experience uh, with respect to skilling programs, NCVT qualifications, and uh, he is looking forward to renewable energy space. Uh, and the session will be moderated by the architect of today's program, is Ulka Kelkar. She's the director at the climate program at WRI India, and she's an economist and huge experience in this space. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you yeah. so much, Amitosh. I've never been called the architect of anything before, <laughs> so thanks. Uh, we don't need any context. I think the previous speakers have very much set it out for us in detail. So we'll delve right in and give as much time as we can to all the experts in this panel. Dr. Patnaik, I'll start with you. Um, you're an economist who's written about macroeconomic trends, the investment and capital formation that India needs. But now you're the chief economist at one of India's biggest conglomerates. Um, how do you see the big macroeconomic trends in terms of low carbon shifts and how they're affecting Indian industries? There are opportunities like renewable energy, you know, economies of scale are making it cheaper. But there are also threats like this carbon border adjustment mechanism. Uh, some of the challenges that are being posed currently for us, uh, and let me start uh, just by introducing the corporate sector, which I come from now, and where often people say that it's easier for them to transition than for MSMEs to transition, like we heard some of the speakers say in the morning. Uh, so the kind of sectors that uh, my group is in, the Aditya Bidla group is in, is cement, uh, aluminum. Uh, these are very hard to abate sectors. So it's not as if the technology is changing easily. Some of the only changes that we really need, some of the big changes I should say we need, uh, would be changes that happen uh, in the grid. So if India moves from say thermal power to renewables where, you know, today there are many difficulties, grid storage is a difficulty. So in fact, uh, if it moved to let's say nuclear power, then that would be something that would make it easy for sectors like hours to reduce their CO2 emissions. Whereas at the moment, uh, given the technology as it is, these are very hard to abate sectors. And it is a challenge of how without a transition in the national grid or state grids, how without that transition, uh, the country is going to make this transition to uh, low carbon emissions. Sometimes I feel that that is the least discussed 
uh, component of the transition while it is the most important element of the transition. So when, um, as you correctly said, when challenges like CBAM, which are just around the corner, come in and within CBAM, the f you know, both cement and aluminum are among the first sectors uh, in the uh, six sectors that uh, uh, Europe has identified. The challenge comes first to us in terms of uh, how do we make this transition. Uh, today, these uh, industries, uh, including aluminum, steel, cement, depend a lot on captive power. And this captive power usually has been coming from coal. Is There is an attempt to have it come from uh, renewables, both wind and solar. But because storage is still very expensive, uh, it is not a smooth transition. So I would say that in terms of the challenges, if I was to put down the number one challenge that uh, industry faces, uh, it would be power. And how is India going to move away from thermal power? Do we have a consistent set of policies across the country? Are state uh, electricity boards and uh, the central government Ministry of Power, Ministry of Environment, actually, uh, do they have a holistic framework on how we are going to make this transition? In fact, uh, recently, one of the uh, one of our producers in Madhya Pradesh, uh, someone from my company, told me that they actually have to pay a green cess on renewable electricity in Madhya Pradesh. And that came as a big surprise because one thought that the entire policy of the country, of the government is to move towards green energy and you do not want to make it uncompetitive. So I would uh, you know, stop there uh, because there are a large number of speakers after me and we'll come back to the other issues perhaps. Yeah. Thank you so much. May I request Mr. Vinnie Mehta, I mean, continuing with this theme of a large company, um, you know, your sustainable manufacturing program at ACMA has been a great example. How do you think large companies, OEMs, MSME associations can support MSMEs in this transition? Uh, so uh, let me sort of demystify some of the things. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, compliments to you on the report. Uh, that you're coming out, uh, especially on the auto sector. And uh, yes, uh, there are challenges in terms of industry transitioning to electric mobility. Um, and uh, not just that the number of parts are going to be um, sort of reduced to a hundred of what you use, uh, but also uh, the model that the industry is adopting is that of vertical integration, uh, because these are high technology items and uh, OEMs would like to keep to themselves. Uh, say a Tesla would like to manufacture everything in-house. So the opportunity for suppliers to supply to the OEMs is also very getting reduced. And uh, uh, MSMEs would probably feature as tier twos and tier threes. And therefore, the opportunities are even less for them to supply. That's one part of the story. But it's not that, uh, you know, it's doomsday because uh, at least uh, we take solace uh, that India would be transitioning to carbon neutrality by 2070. And uh, that uh, there is still some time, but also say, 2030, uh, you are saying 30% of car would be electric, 70% uh, wouldn't be, would be still ice. And uh, by that time, we believe the volumes would have doubled from the current 4 million units. They're just the cars and there are two wheelers and tractors and uh, commercial vehicles. Uh, commercial vehicles, we yet do not have uh, a, a economic, economically viable solution to transition to a carbon neutral and uh, probably hydrogen could be one electric definitely at this juncture doesn't seem like it two wheelers definitely the transition is going to be very very fast uh, probably 70 to 80 percent or could be 100 percent two wheelers by 2030 
so a lot of the two wheel uh, the msme is engaged in the two wheeler value chain could face a lot of problem there's no denying that uh, but there are also opportunities uh, it's much easy for me to say uh, for them to uh, look at adjacencies um, say um, the the tractor industry probably will take a much the time to transition to electric um, there are adjacencies such as the defense sector where a lot of the casting and forging uh, would uh, be consumed and uh, also uh, some of these sectors that i mentioned the casting and the forging sectors consume a lot of power and then uh, what madam just said on green power availability of the green power is also going to be a question so uh, it is definitely a big big challenge uh, having said that at acma um, we are industry body that represents the auto component industry we represent only the organized sector we do not represent the unorganized sector and uh, while 60% of our members are msmes i represent around 825 companies uh, while 60% of them are msmes of them uh, probably there are no micro uh, just about a countable few small and the rest of them are all medium um, so and and therefore when you are uh, dealing with relatively um, financially better off companies it is much easier compared to the micro uh, which is probably the most vulnerable in the entire value chain we've been making quite a few interventions um, and uh, we are probably one of the very few industry bodies that has a very successful record in implementing cluster programs um, till date we have made 1400 plants world class uh, some of them are 35 of them are zero effect zero defect and um, there are at least six programs that are uh, running uh, with the focus on the sdgs various kinds of sdgs not all because people can't absorb all programs at one go uh, um, uh, one of the areas that we focus also apart not just looking at energy uh, and and resource efficiency is women and safety uh whenever we begin a program on cluster any which one we spend at least 15% of our curriculum on safety because there are a lot of accidents that happen in the automotive value chain and we also make sure that at least there is a toilet for women functional hygienic toilet for women which is a basic human uh, requirement um so Uh, it's interesting it's going to be tough uh, we what we do probably is just a drop in the ocean uh, i don't have enough resources to really multiply these programs into very many because i'm autonomous we are a private uh, industry body mm-hmm. so there i would rest here there'll be a lot of things to talk about but uh, yes i'm 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 happy that um, what we're doing is making a meaningful contribution Um, but again there is much more to be done so thank you for let having me, me let yeah. me continue from where you left off and uh, request dr singh i think in, even though there are many promising schemes in india we always get this feeling this overwhelming feeling that anything is a drop in the ocean and so much more is needed so similarly on finance there are many schemes for msmes many from sidbi what more do you think needs to be done so that it reaches those you know the gap that is there can be bridged um, this just transition i would call uh, for msme uh, we say just as now transition so we have to go for it and the second is justified transition see india we uh, our asian economies if you see uh, 70% of coal production we do globally and so the transition has to be justified so what we are trying to weave uh, when sitbi is attending as a principal dfi uh, we call ourselves as development first institution uh, uh, so what we are trying to weave our programs uh, to ensure that uh, these excess versus excess means excess versus a double cess is balanced properly and how do we do that is i, I will just uh, go on telling the programs which we have woven and how we are addressing so the first uh, we have adopted five missionary approach the first is uh, mission 2.5k solar so what we are working out is uh, in this financial year minimum 2500 msmes to go solar rooftop 
Uh, we did this in last FA in five months. Uh, we could induce MSME to invest in solar rooftop uh, on a cluster centric basis. And that is the solution number one, where the, any intervention and engagement for cheap uh, or uh, say uh, uh, cheaper resources being made available has to be through cluster approach. So what we do is if in a cluster, uh, 20 or more MSME go for solar rooftop, we reduce the interest rate. So that is the first level we have come out. And second, we say ki, uh, said we will not charge uh, upfront fee uh, for uh, cluster centric investment coming forward. So that is one uh, we have woven as mission 2.5K solar. The second is we are working on mission EV for eco, which is creating an ecosystem for EV. And uh, for that, we are working out with a few multilaterals uh, to weave a risk sharing facility such that the access to credit is eased out and access uh, to dispensable credit is also facilitated. So what we are working is on one side, we are working with NBFCs to reduce their interest rate in terms of they getting funds at uh, cheaper rates. We have evolved a scheme for them. And second is MSME going for investment. Uh, we are uh, making that access easier. And third is uh, we are weaving a risk sharing facility where the perception of banker or the NBFCs, most of the uh, present players in EV space are NBFCs. And these are uh, one who are at either startup to step up level and they are facing the real problem of access to funds. So we are trying to create these uh, facility and bring down the cost to the end consumer. So that is the uh, second level. So risk sharing facility SIDBI has been doing for last seven years. Uh, to kindle energy efficiency market in the country and have created a market for ESCOs uh, to operate uh, here. There are almost 140 plus ESCOs in the country. We have worked with more than 30, 540. And uh, in risk sharing facility, what we do is any case which is in newer area, emerging area, we do the technical evaluation and then go for risk coverage. So that way, 100% of our portfolio, which we have done in seven years, have been intact, uh, standard asset. And so that gives bankers a more uh, uh, sort of inclination to go for these. So SIDBI started on its own. Today we have 14 bankers uh, who are partnered to us in risk sharing facility. So that brings us to the third uh, mission, which is mission energy efficiency. 1000 crore we have earmarked within SIDBI uh, for energy efficiency. Because if we see, we have operated in more than 100 clusters across. 1000 uh, clusters are energy inefficient and we are trying to address that uh, by easing access. The fourth is which uh, your study points out uh, and in EV also what we have embedded is if women entrepreneurs or enterprises are looking for access, uh, we reduce the risk premium which we uh, generally uh, no, introduce on the when, when we uh, get the cost of funds loaded for interest rate purpose. So there we are trying to bring down this for inducing access. The fourth, uh, which, uh, which is important is, uh, we call it nurture the nature, which is the MT of uh, D is technology. So as it came out in the, your uh, study also, uh, there is, uh, you have to have a proper, uh, say balance between trusted and rusted technologies. So people MSME should know that these are trusted technologies identified by uh, somebody expertise like you. Uh, so we are working with TIFAC uh, mm -hmm. and BE. We have uh, already have a stack of 1000 technologies which are clean, green, energy efficient. So I tell or uh, uh, say banking last mile officers, don't worry about the technical aspect. We will take care digitally. So now digital is the uh, one solution which can reduce the interest rate as also the turnaround time. We have already tested it in SIDBI. Uh, today uh, we have created a good portfolio where we have created digital access and that is another solution for uh, lowering down uh, uh, the interest rate or access. But above all these, as uh, uh, Mehtaji was mentioning, See, uh, the most important thing is to address the micro and the livelihood part, right? And uh, so bottom up story, only India will bring on board. 
uh, everywhere this is top bottom story which has been talked about and we are working on this bottom up story by adopting pluses we have launched a program which is project grit which is green inclusivity program and one example i will give you is we are working in moradabad where we are enabling transition from coal fired to gas fired furnaces already we have done 25 and uh, the issue was quite different in the sense uh, the entire family is engaged in this brass cluster 90% uh, have lungs problem and uh, they were household enterprises so not formalized so nobody was uh, looking at them as a solution so we we have uh, tried to bring that as a solution uh, uh, and so that is very important we are going to work in at least 50 classes okay. uh, in a uh, short uh, say span of few years mm -hmm. and last uh, point <laughs> because i'm taking a lot of time uh, is uh, like uh, we have worked in sundarbans uh, when it was uh, affected by that uh, they had a impact of cyclonic impact was there so and that project we worked was initially we worked with them on subsistence part then we once they were able to sit up we worked on the sustenance part and third level we have brought them to is we are linking their vocation to green and we call it Sanji, Sundarban's Greens. That is how the story of uh, uh, grading up right. has to be built up. <coughs> Thank you so much for sharing those very specific examples. Dr. Sabina Divan, if I might move to you. I mean, we've all spoken about the unique challenges of the informal workers, migrant workers that are there in MSMEs. What do you think is the key issue, you know, in terms of creating decent jobs, decent livelihoods for them? Thank you so much, Oka, and thanks to WRI, not just for the invitation to be here today, but I think often these conversations happen at the 10,000 foot level, and it's really amazing to see the on the ground work that WRI is doing in a variety of different areas to really, uh, uh, you know, address the impact of climate change and the transition on people's lives at the, at the ground level. So congratulations on that. I think when we talk about MSMEs and employment in the context of climate change and energy, I think there are two parts to this story. One part is the resilience and the strength of the MSMEs themselves. Because as we saw with the pandemic, you know, where 35 to 40% of that MSME, some estimates suggest, uh, uh, of these small businesses actually failed because they didn't have the financial reserves or they didn't, uh, because they were unregistered, they couldn't avail government support. This has a knock-on effect on employment in general. So the first part of this story is actually building the support and the resilience for MSMEs so that they can withstand crises. And as climate crises accelerate, that becomes even more important. The second part of this story is the kinds of conditions of work these small businesses provide to workers, right? So some of these data, as Ashwini already brought up, but let me just repeat it. There's about 63.4 million MSMEs, uh, and 20% of them are female-owned. These are non-agricultural small businesses. They employ approximately 111 million workers. That is one-fifth of the workforce and one-third of employment. Now, here's the interesting stuff. 99% of these MSMEs are micro enterprises, if you look at their turnover. And 99% have fewer than 20 employees. And approximately 70% of these are unregistered. Why are these data important? These last three numbers are extremely important because one, that means that the unregistered informal enterprises, small businesses themselves, cannot avail government support Right? And that becomes critical when we're talking about building their capacity to facilitate the transition. And two, they fall beyond the purview of labor regulations and providing any kind of entitlements to mo most entitlements to their workers, which means that the workers that work in these enterprises are then completely uncovered and beyond any purview of labor protections or social protections. Right. So. When it comes to actually building resilience from the ground up, and we're talking about workers themselves, I think, yes, we have to work on the one hand on building the uh, support systems for MSMEs so that they're stronger and resilient, so that they don't have knock-on effects on workers. 
But the other part of this, and we've heard a lot of very small but fabulous examples today, but these are small examples of building skills or providing different kinds of entitlements to workers. When we're talking at the scale that India needs, the, the scale of our employment challenges, with about 70% of our workforce that's informal, uh, a huge share of migrant workers, most of which are completely beyond the purview of any kind of social protection, social security, labor rights of any kind. Uh, and these challenges will only accelerate. We're seeing growing labor market precarity as climate incidents and the energy transition come about. We're going to only see the uncertainty and the precarity grow. If we want solutions to these challenges, they have to be systemic at the government level. They have to be structural, uh, you know, structural changes. So if we look at some of the other countries and what they're providing by way of, of safety nets and, and uh, labor protections, you, in developing countries, we have large informal sector, which also means that the need is so great, right? That's where the need is the greatest at the same time that both the fiscal and the institutional capacity to actually provide, whether it's labor protections or skills training systems, is the least. Uh, but there are examples of countries that are doing this. Some countries like Mexico and uh, uh, Mexico and Argentina, for example, are providing universal coverage for specific aspects of social security, whether it's health, uh, whether it's health or pensions. Other countries like South Africa, for example, are experimenting with doing an, a broad uh, social security system that covers all workers, including informal and unorganized sector workers. Right? At the end of the day, I don't, as wonderful as these small uh, examples of skills training systems or entitlement programs that we're seeing, they're great examples. But if we want to really solve this problem at scale, it has to be at a broad institutional government level. And this is particularly true for skills training because skills training, you know, we do, and, and, and especially when we're talking about women. When we're talking about women and we're talking about skills training in general, what we don't want is to create a three month, six month, one year training program that comes on the back of poor quality education that provides absolutely no pathway for career development, for individuals, right? And this is often where women are relegated. Women are relegated to the low value add, the easiest low hanging fruit. Let's give women jobs at home because at least they're doing something. Or let's put them in brick kilns because at least they're doing something, right? And one of the questions, and then I'll stop, Olga, one of the questions that comes up is, first, you know, as we create better jobs as new jobs and perhaps these are some of these jobs are better jobs that might come up in msmes with renewables and you know uh, uh climate adaptation and so on if these are better jobs will they be available to women or are those jobs then going to become desirable for the large and growing male populations <laughs> that we have right um so these these questions are large questions i think the solutions when we talk about worker entitlements or entitlements for women in particular, uh, I think they have to be systemic. They have to be at the government level. Um, and I think when we're talking about skills training in particular, I think we have to be really mindful that skills training so far has not really worked at scale in the way that it is now. We need to be thinking about actually creating proper environments that have pathways for individuals to grow and develop. Otherwise, otherwise, Ms., you know, Dr. Patnayak said that she you've pointed out to what you think is the most salient uh, issue for corporates. I think one of the most salient issues for the transitions, if we don't get this situation with workers right, you won't have a just transition because it won't be, not only will it not be just, but it also won't be politically viable unless you crack the workers and protections question. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina. And that's a perfect segue to the next two speakers who represent the skilling uh, uh, initiative the endeavor. Uh, from the Skill Council for Green Jobs and the textiles, uh, Textile Sector Skill Council. So if I may request maybe Dr. Yadav to speak first a little bit, so because I think these uh, previous panelists have spoken about this challenge that new workforce, new workers will have to be skilled for new green jobs, but the existing workers may have to be reskilled because certain aspects of the value chain may get hit by these kinds of things. And then there is a special challenge to the women workers. So uh, in uh, 
hang dyeing activity which is uh, basically uh, dyeing the material in loose form so they are using all kind of dyes all kind of colorful uh, things which they feel that it will attract the buyer or attract the uh, uh, the community but somehow at the back of the mind uh, the thing is that uh, those kind of uh, dyes is very very harmful and uh, we are now gradually uh, putting them through some educational programs in what way they can uh, make uh, the use of natural dyes or more eco friendly uh, friendly dyes which is uh, acceptable to even a foreign buyer and uh, uh, in that regard most of the ngos we are working with uh, uh, in the areas in uh, orissa particularly in orissa and uh, in uh, uttarakhand uh the uh, the other component of uh, making uh, or bringing the circular circularity into picture and making them more aware is the recycling so the major component uh, of that comes in what way the waste which is generated by the msm sector can be made use of in recycling because uh, as it appears that uh, but the handloom uh, in msme sector the most of the waste goes in the landfill so that is not either um, reaching to a recyclable uh, end use so that is uh, how we are now looking at the reskilling and upskilling kind of initiatives in that direction in what way the waste can be segregated right at the cluster level and uh, in what way uh, A certain certain population of that msme can be employed in uh, literally uh, using those materials in making some some products out of that uh, so uh, the most notable out of that use has been uh, putting uh, the so called chindis the 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 small small materials which is taken out and the women as in cottage industry they are making uh the coarser kind of uh, fabrics out of that and that is very well accepted uh, particularly in the regions like uh, in uh, in northern northern india uh, in in kashmir if you talk about uh, their own fiber usage uh, which is waste fiber which is coming from the wool uh, from the sheep and so those are making uh, use in these kind of uh, products and uh, if we talk about uh, if i give the specific example of almora where the women have literally gone into this activity and that has very well uh, sold uh, the other component of uh, as uh, mr singh has elaborated on resiliency uh, we we are bringing the handloom weavers uh, into some kind of uh, Uh, forward linkages uh, for example when we talk about the covid situation uh, we had um, the handloom weavers from uh, mizoram they have uh, been making uh, the bags out of because they couldn't sell the materials so this is how they were able to make the bags and those were eventually sold in the various fairs in delhi so that's how the resiliency part has to be brought in and uh, if you talk about the rest of the msme sector which is more or less formalized so there uh, the migration is happening in terms of niche areas for example the latest one is the technical textiles so so that is how uh, that sector is uh, thank you if i could ask mr bharti to address the same question skilling and if i could also ask the audience while we have the last two speakers think of no no not yet think of questions keep your hands ready we will we will definitely come to you but mr bharti uh, thank you wri for inviting on this uh, very important discussion today and uh, i am bringing the perspective from the sectoral skill council for green job which is um, is really looking the green sector mainly and uh, majorly in renewable energy sector i am fortunate to here uh, discuss this topic because i have been working in uh, solar industry on the different scale i have managed the project i had uh, managed the people who has work on the site so i understand the technicality the you know perspective of a uh, site engineer perspective of a technician at the site and for them just transition is very important especially for those people who are who are thinking that their job uh, may be on the threat 
so i can uh, quote few example which we have in the past experience like uh, you know uh, very uh, quite obvious people sitting maybe in the audience from the power sector background especially in the renewable energy they can understand and realize this fact you know initially when uh, you know rooftop programs came and net metering policy came in the picture from the government from the different state government uh, especially the utility engineer and the discom engineer they were apprehension you know uh, to give the you know uh, net metering connection easily to the developers they were very resistance on that part they were not cooperating not supporting on that when very many companies faced challenges in that way so project got delayed the timeline got delayed for you know commissioning of the projects why did do they um, because what my uh, you know experience uh, you know coming across with them they thought that uh, you know conventional power system are there you know uh, bread and butter for them especially uh, bringing renewable in the system is a kind of change for them and that Uh, for that, for that change, they were not ready to accept. And gradually, uh, you know, what made even the government? It, it was a very, uh, you know, long term, uh, you know, uh, especially uh, resistance from the discom side. Ultimately, what government do? Uh, they make uh, discom as a major stakeholder for implementing the projects and uh, for disbursing the subsidy and all those. And a lot of training has been done on uh, those people, but because they thought that. Uh, you know they were not understanding about the technology and uh, they thought it create a problem it create a problem in technical way it can create a problem for their uh, you know um, job wise uh, so but gradually they accepted the, the technology they got so much of the trainings they understood the technology they understood the benefit of the technology they understood the whole green world you know green sector you know advantage in the coming energy transition so now you can see many state uh, discom are well aware about the technology they are very pro towards this technology so this is the one example i can quote uh, you know uh, we have developed uh, many qualification can you know keeping in context of the bottom at the pyramid especially uh, you know we are talking about the msme sector so lot of uh, you know um, you know uh, if you if you see the whole industry of uh, solar industry there is structured company there is informal sector especially the inc companies who are who are people who are responsible for constructing the projects they were many of them the company are uh, I, i agree with the ma'am that uh, many company are not registered they are not getting benefit of the many uh, things uh, and even the workers who who basically responsible for you know uh, uh, carrying the material from one place to another place putting the panel on the you know mounting structure those companies are at the bottom of the pyramid even the epcs company and i mean they they don't care about i mean they, if they see the chunk of project cost they are hardly would be 5% of the total project cost and the work that you know carrying is very important solar plant looks very uh, you know big and very good in sense and uh, we thought that it, some big problem can be create a big problem but it's not like that case Uh, in a small issues you know small uh, mistake by a you know technician could lead to a big hazards you know i quote the one of the plant in tesla where it was got fired and this was uh, you know rather i you know afterwards it was uh, uh, inquired that what was the reason of uh, getting the fire of that uh, plant it was only a single mc4 connector so single mc4 connector the importance on that if you not understand how to crimp a you know wire how to properly insert the you know connector you cannot do a quality work and for that matter bringing those people who are marginalized who are in formal sector bringing in the structure of the you know proper fragmented uh, you know whole sector it should uh, we cannot be do justice and we should be start with that to you know bringing the uh, just transition for them thank you from us thank you thank you very much but many of the initiatives that you've heard about whether it is for finance or whether it is for skilling do you fear that unless special attention is paid to women's access to these initiatives that existing inequities will actually get exacerbated how can the low carbon transition also create opportunities for women led msmes and women workers in these MSMEs? i would like to start with a story uh, back in february i was out on field for this program that we are doing on digitalization of msmes and this entrepreneur called up because she got to know somebody from delhi is here right so we have all the knowledge so she called up and she asked me what sort of paper should she should she should use for this machine that she had procured so it was a paper bag making machine but she didn't know which gsm quality would be compatible with it right so what i sense is there is this information mismatch like 
information that gets conveyed to say clusters or urban agglomerations aren't exactly reaching out to the rural pockets and most of these machinery that's used there's no point of sale within rural area right your distribution networks are again very urban centric i'm talking more in the context of northern india not tamil nadu at at, at this point at all but uh, they seem to not have adequate amc right your maintenance cost for the um, maintenance contracts for your products uh, for the machinery that's being used is not available as easily as you'd expect it sitting here right so there are all these challenges that need to be addressed so can we create a structure where green solutions or decentralized renewable energy devices or whatever mechanism that we are choosing to facilitate the transition whether the production and the distribution of it can be feminized in some respect so that we have you know some level of cascade in the rural pockets as well another thing i worked across various ministries and different programs so nsdc was among the places that i worked with and our programs tend to be very siloed right there's a massive investment that's underway through nrlm with which i currently work so we have uh, cluster level federations we have sgs there are various loan products and sashay loan products not like major big loans there are community enterprise funds community investment funds all these sources are made available to women part of the sg federation and these are targeted for entrepreneurs apart from this you also have some untied funds which can also be redirected towards women entrepreneurs so instead of trying to reinvent the wheel there can we have a fund that set up to facilitate transition to dre right incentivize them create bank linkage programs with interest subvention which are you know the mainstay with nrlm why not adopt such practices with not uh, with renewable energy devices as well so i guess i'll stop there just one point on information again so um, information is a social good it's a public good and no private player is going to fill that gap so unless there's a commercially viable case the larger entrepreneurs will of course not transition to it but with smaller entrepreneurs there has to be a continuous sustainable system so that they get information that's required i mean the sensitization needs to be at their domestic level and it has to be something that's grounded in those community institutions which various organizations are creating so there has to be a continuity in the program design itself when uh, such approaches are taken up thanks thank you so much and as promised audience questions now you already have your hand up anyone one more yeah very good afternoon it's indeed a very well demarcation of this session what i have heard about myself is a advisory consultant for msme and startup india my question to uh, dr yadav and dr singh do, do don't you feel that there is a big challenge in textile industries as a incentive part for our exporters number 1 in comparison to that bangladesh is having much more weightage parallel to this export and government of bangladesh has given a incentive of maximum 62% ranging from 28 to 62% so don't you think that our textile is having a massive growth in terms of volume is concerned need of the importers globally so don't you think that government should take a initiative for this schemes to attract much more investments much thank more you. things thank to do in this context thanks thanks second is second is <laughs> to the second is to dr singh is that if any entrepreneur is coming up with startup program what are the ease of doing business loans can be provided can you please put some light on it thank, thank you. you thank you the question from here please hi uh good afternoon everybody uh, we are a small 3 3 month old startup uh we are developing a platform that we think does four aspects measurement mitigation discovery uh, akin to drug discovery in an industry value chain 
uh we help them with business risk management Amitosh, and reporting there was a lady at the back sorry that's sorry yeah uh, it's a, it's a reporting platform which does all of these elements discovery management and risk at the end of the day uh, we just completed a pilot and that's the case that i wanted to present for a sheet metal fabricator and ma'am when you say energy is one of the largest components for us to look at within our analysis of the emission footprint of that sme that we just worked with 80% is roughly between two things the steel that they use and the energy that they consume that's the emission footprint breakage for them uh, uh, coming at it from a tech perspective it it gave it, it uh, got me wondering we are looking at two aspects here what we call as a nested loop and a recursive loop in technology a nested loop is as you keep breaking it down and down and going backwards in the value chain you are coming back to maybe the large manufacturers again the steel manufacturer the energy producer the energy producer might say you know the coal mining guy uh, gives me my biggest emission footprint the coal mining guy might say something else so how do you break this cycle as policy makers and people who are developing multiple solutions things are getting much more complicated and how do we right. break that cycle in multiple fronts so as the panelist to think or who which of you would like to address that question madam uh, specifically how uh, you know apart from phased uh, implementation Uh, for msmes uh, how can trade agreements uh, actually uh, you know factor in msmes when they uh, um, sort of uh, looking at environmental provisions uh, that's just my thank question thank you you're from uh, i'm from the australian high commission thank you uh, how do you feel about uh, <clears throat> uh, this thing uh, just transition Um, just energy transition partnership uh, advocated by G7 countries. How would it uh, accommodate mm. the MSMEs and uh, informal sectors? So you are talking about startup. Startup India program is there. Sidbi is fund of fund. Uh, we are managing it. There is a platform which is already out there where one can log in and uh, connect with the AIFs. Second uh, option for startups is Sidbi has its own subsidiary, Sidbi Venture Capital. Uh, you can always have a look at that. Third, we have recently created uh, along with our uh, French partners, AFD uh, and Shakti Foundation and Sidbi uh, for greening the financial ecosystem. Uh, we have created Gifts platform, which is Green Indian Financial System, and within within that, I will come. Uh, within that uh, we have created a grow network which is for green financing for women and there we have started a pitching platform where any entrepreneur who is thinking of moving up the value chain they can come and uh, bid for it right uh, when it comes to aifs uh, uh, like uh, anybody at uh, no pre seeds uh, and up level they can be there uh, they can approach that uh, pattern uh, if they grow on to the next level then said we has started its own venture debt program where we directly also entertain uh, proposals emanating from uh, these startups who are looking up the value chain actually the time has gone when uh, we we should compare ourselves with, with the scenarios of bangladesh or so because uh, uh, because of that only uh, we we see a situation in msme sector wherein there is a race to uh, to, to go for a low produce kind of thing and uh, that is how the outdated machines are coming in india uh, particularly in the msme sector which is not at all energy efficient but uh, because of some factors uh, which is actually uh, known to everyone uh, they uh, they are leading to uh, usage of those machines wherein the government is highly promoting through the upgradation programs wherein for example a power loom weaver uh, who produces uh, the fabric on a normal uh, uh, mechanized machine uh, uh, so to migrate from that machine to a modern energy efficient machines such as sulger looms and the water jet looms which is in fact uh, most of the weavers in uh, surat cluster they are using it so that that is what we should uh, the government should promote actually now Uh, uh coming to the bangladesh scenario uh, which is more or less working on the volumes uh, the time has come in fact uh, most of the startups uh, they they have uh, be, uh, very much active on the niche kind of uh, products as i as i said earlier that uh, the technical textiles is uh, one of the area which uh, we should focus on 
uh, that is how the low investment and high value kind of scenario we have to uh, migrate on. Um, that's all from me. Uh, so uh, Ulkas asked me to in, uh, speak on textiles because, as you, some of you might know, uh, Grasim, uh, which is of the Aditya Birla Group, is one of the world's biggest uh, textile companies. Now, let me just uh, step in on the Bangladesh story because we uh, also get a chance to see why uh, you know uh, producers go to Bangladesh. Now they get uh, fabric from China. Uh, on which we would have our duty rates are 30% and they get them at zero duty. So obviously the fabric is free. And then because of SAFTA, yeah, they, we take the uh, zero duty also on the uh, product that comes in. So at the end of it, the uh, if you look at um, organized uh, ready-made uh, apparel industry, then in the last one year, their imports and largely from Bangladesh, but also from uh, Vietnam, etc., have gone up uh, from 33% to 62%. So organized retail in India is currently importing from Bangladesh because there is a huge cost advantage. So in addition to that, what the government uh, guys tell us, uh, the ready-made garment uh, manufacturers tell us is that after Manrega, the uh, wage rate in India is 10,000 per month, whereas Bangladesh is 5,000. And they work 12, year, uh, 12 months of the year, whereas here they work about 7 to 8 months. So their skill levels are actually much higher. Now, this makes it a very much bigger systemic problem because, you know, we can't address the duty rates. We can't address the FTAs that we have where we are getting stuff at zero duties. The national textile policy in the Ministry of Textile website is 2002. So I think perhaps the first thing we need to do is to be aware that we are in 2023 and the world is a different world today. And we need to, I mean, there have been drafts which have gone back and forth. There's a long story. I don't have time for that but there is a need to relook at our textile policy as a whole i'll just step in quickly because ulka asked me to on the cbam question you see currently what we are expecting is that msmes will be out of the uh, eu cbam at least in the current vision that goes till 2034 but I think at the end of the day, we also need to worry about the fact that MSMEs are there. There are digital pass product passports instead. So even if you're saying an MSME is out of it, what if the MSME is using our aluminium or our viscose in their or steel in their products? When they're using those, they that part may start getting counted as embedded carbon. So the whole story of I mean I come back to uh, the, combi the kind of collaboration that needs to happen between large industry and small industry. And that also answers your uh, concern that it cannot be that we are treating MSMEs as a separate sector. So, you know, I've not spoken much about the just, but about the transition part of it, the fact that we have to go low carbon. And there, I think it's very important that large industry and small industry work together because there are all these auditing, verifying uh, elements of CBAM where it will be too costly for small industry to do on their own. So the government has to facilitate this collaboration between large industry and small industry. I can certainly say that we as a group are very concerned because we we export like half the aluminium Indalco produces is exported roughly. So we are very concerned because the whole world will move to. Today is just CBAM. How to secure the interest of MSMEs when it comes to the FTAs. Um, I, I, I think the government is extremely proactive in engaging with the industry on inputs. Uh, we, at least I speak from a perspective of the auto component industry. Uh, we are being consulted on every single uh, FTAs, whether the new ones or we are looking at the existing ones and revisiting those. Um, um, so if you are able to convince your point of view, the government is very willing to listen. Uh, I, I don't think so there's any problem per se. But I think one must also understand uh, that 
uh, we have been very conservative uh, as people or as an industry and we are very wary of exports and therefore we are very hesitant in signing FTAs. Um, ACMA takes a very different view to it. Um, we are a very export-led industry and, and, and we would really support the government in the FTAs. So um, again, it really depends if securing the right means being protective. I do not know how much the government would listen to you. Yeah, Thank there you are. There are many different stakeholders present on this stage. We have people who represent skilling, finance, big companies, small companies, men, women. Um, if you could do a little bit of matchmaking and set them a challenge for the next three years, what do you think we should take on? And so many more in the audience. We have Fame TN, um, former secretary of the Ministry of MSME. If you could just do my work for me as session chair and say, what's the one thing that, you know, a few of us could work together, what WRI India could do working with these people? Thank you, uh, Ulka. I, I don't think anyone can fill your big shoes and certainly not uh, summarize this very stimulating and insightful panel with distinguished panelists. What I will say is that what's very apparent is that we've presented now a number of different aspects of a very big problem. And what is clear is that unless these different players, big companies that have these supply chains that are full of smaller MSMEs that that uh, you know, su supply. Uh, we have skills training institutions that we need to transition workers. We have the sector skill councils. We have banking. All of these different stakeholders that are here. I think we really have to all come together and deal with this problem in a systemic way because the impact of climate change and the energy transition is going to have far-reaching effects that can't be addressed in silos. So I think the real contribution that WRI is already doing and continue to do is to bring all of us together to come up with systemic solutions to this very large, no longer existential problem that we're all confronting. So I'll stop there. Thank you. And I'll take inspiration from Sijo's story. And I think at WRI India, it is it should be our endeavor to not work at a very high level, but actually go into those little details that you talked about. Uh, but thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Ulka, uh, and to all the panelists. So, and uh, many thanks to the audience for patiently hearing for, from all of us from the last two hours. Uh, this has been a wonderful panel. As you see that all the stakeholders are being represented in this panel. And you as being an audience have asked the very right questions. Very, very important for the sector to develop. And with the work which we are doing as WRI India, supporting them uh, with the help of our stakeholders. So uh, with this, I thank everyone for being here, present with us. And I would request all of you to kindly join us for the lunch. With this, we conclude. Thank you very much.